Mr. President, the families that I talk to in my home state of Washington are not interested in partisan back and forth that we see so much of here in Washington, D.C. They are thinking about how they're going to get their bills paid. And they're wondering when and if they'll be able to save enough to retire. And they're hoping that they're going to be able to give their children a better future. They rightfully expect us to focus on strengthening the economy and creating jobs which will make it easier for them to reach those important goals. Now, we've had an opportunity, in the, many opportunities in the last few months, to move forward on legislation like the Senate budget and the appropriations bills that were approved in Senator Mikulski's committee, which could remove some of the uncertainty that is putting a drag on our economic recovery. But instead, we are here today on the floor of the Senate to debate a temporary, a temporary stopgap measure to fund the government just days away from a possible shutdown. Now, I think all but a few of my colleagues would agree with me that these circumstances are far from ideal. So as we work to pass this bill, this temporary stopgap bill, and continue negotiations on the longer uh, term budget deal, I think it's really important to consider exactly how we got to this point, what this continuing resolution means in the context of ongoing discussions, and what needs to happen for us to reach a more comprehensive agreement that works for our families and for our economy. Now, as we all remember, Mr. President, if Democrats and many Republicans as well had their way, we could have begun a bipartisan budget conference between the House and Senate months ago and prevented this chaos. When the Senate passed a budget, I was very hopeful that both sides would come together and work out an agreement that would end this cycle of governing by crisis and allow us to focus on creating jobs and economic growth. Well, Democrats have come to the floor 18 times now, 18 times, to try to begin a bipartisan conference with the House on our budget resolutions. Many Republicans thought this made sense. They agreed we should at least sit down and try to get a deal. But, as we all know now, an extreme minority of the Republicans saw things differently and they believed they would have more leverage if they created a crisis, like the one we're approaching now, than a few months ago when there wasn't a looming deadline. And those Tea Party Republicans, backed by the Republican leadership, stood up and said no to the bipartisan budget negotiations 18 times against the wishes of members on both sides of the aisle. So today, when we could have been focusing on the real challenges Americans are facing, we are instead focused on preventing the Tea Party from shutting down the government. All because Tea Party Republicans want another shot at dismantling the Affordable Care Act, which, by the way, was passed by a supermajority upheld by the Supreme Court and was a major issue the American people weighed in on in the 2012 election. Mr. President, in the House continuing resolution, Tea Party Republicans are fighting to take away health care coverage for millions of Americans and get rid of crucial services like prevention and wellness visits for Medicare patients prescription drug savings for our seniors that we fought so hard for, and coverage for over 92,000 Americans who have pre-existing conditions. This is absurd. It is a non-starter. There is no way Democrats are going to give in to these demands that are so clearly harmful to the American people. And the same is true of the fight the Tea Party Republicans are trying to pick over the debt limit. Now, some Republicans claim it's typical to threaten a catastrophic and unprecedented default in order to extract political concessions. But the fact is, the opposite is true. The vast majority of debt limit increases in the last three decades occurred independent of efforts to reduce the deficit or put in place budget reforms. And while Democrats are more than happy to negotiate on the budget, and we've been trying to do that for the last six months, we do stand firmly behind President Obama and are not going to negotiate about whether 
the United States of America pays its bills. We believe families and businesses should not have to deal with any more of that uncertainty. And honestly, Mr. President, I do think a lot of Republicans agree. More than a dozen Republicans have spoken out to discourage the Tea Party from starting a pointless debate over defunding the Affordable Care Act in the bill to prevent a government shutdown. And I know that quite a few Republicans agree brinksmanship over the debt ceiling is the height of irresponsibility. And Mr. President, given all the infighting we've seen recently, governing by crisis clearly isn't working for Republicans. It's certainly not helping Democrats make the investments we feel very strongly our country needs to succeed in the 21st century. And it has put a completely unnecessary burden on our families and our economy. It seems the only ones benefiting from this perpetual crisis mode are Tea Party Republicans. And I see no reason to keep doing them any favors. So I would like to call on the House Republicans to cut the Tea Party loose, give up these partisan games, and pass the Senate's bill to prevent a government shutdown. Now, this bill by no means is a permanent fix. It is not even close. It is temporary. And it continues the cuts from sequestration that are already in place and locked into law until we get a bipartisan deal. But it will keep our government operating while those negotiations continue. And that is critical. Because even though some might not be able to see it here in Washington, D.C., a government shutdown will have serious consequences for families across this country. My home state of Washington is home to more than 100,000 uniformed and civilian defense employees at places like Joint Base Lewis-McChord and Fairchild Air Force Base. Mr. President, if this government shuts down, those men and women in uniform will still have to go to work the next day, but they won't get paid for it. Thousands of civilian defense employees in places like Tacoma and Whidbey Island and Spokane would be forced to do the same, and thousands more could face furloughs. Mr. President, these hardworking Americans and families across my state and the country are already dealing with the consequences of gridlock and dysfunction in Washington, D.C. They are dealing with the across-the-board cuts from sequestration, which continue to pile up. Hundreds of thousands of our defense employees who are now having to wonder about the effects of a shutdown have been furloughed already and have taken pay cuts. Crucial supports and opportunities for vulnerable families and communities from Head Start to Meals on Wheels have been slashed and sequestration is crippling our ability to plan for the future and make the kinds of investments in research and education and infrastructure that will help our work workers succeed. Now, I hear about the impact of these arbitrary cuts whenever I'm home in Washington State. I know every single one of my colleagues here has heard similar stories. Now, the cuts are only going to get worse with time, and they simply have to go. So, Mr. President, when we send this legislation back to the House, Republicans have got to put an end to the Tea Party temper tantrums and pass our bill without any gimmicks and without any games. And after we do that, I hope we can leave the Tea Party brinksmanship behind so those of us on both sides of the aisle who believe in common sense bipartisanship can move forward with negotiations on a desperately needed longer-term deal. And in those negotiations, I'm going to continue fighting for an agreement that ends this governing by crisis and supports our families and economies by replacing sequestration with smarter deficit reduction, evenly divided between spending cuts and new revenue from the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations. Now, I'm fully aware that the Republicans have their priorities as well. And I have never said that reaching an agreement would be easy, but I know Many Democrats and Republicans are sick of brinksmanship and crisis. I know they understand, like we do, that compromise is part of our job description. And I truly believe if those Republicans work with Democrats, we can reach that critically needed, fair, bipartisan agreement that we've been working towards. 
Mr. President, I've heard some of the Tea Party Republicans here in Washington, D.C. dismiss the damaging and costly disruptions a shutdown could cause. Some even seem to think that a default wouldn't be that bad, despite warnings from countless economists that default would be, in fact, catastrophic. But Americans across the country who are still fighting to get back on their feet don't have the luxury of dismissing these risks because they are the ones who are going to be affected. And they are rightfully expecting us to work together and reach a fair budget agreement that offers hardworking families more opportunity and more security. I believe putting the gimmicks and games aside and keeping the government open is a necessary step towards that goal. So I'm going to vote for this temporary continuing resolution and against the Tea Party's dysfunction and brinksmanship. And I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do the same. Mr. President, part of the reason I'm confident that we can reach an agreement is because I know what we can do when we do work together. During this last summer, I worked with Senator Collins to write the Transportation and Housing Appropriations Bill for the coming fiscal year. It included priorities of members on both sides of the aisle and it was approved in our committee with the support of six Republicans. That bill received that strong bipartisan support because it helps families and it helps communities. It gets workers back on the job. It was fiscally responsible and it laid down a strong foundation for long-term and broad-based economic growth. Our bill stands in stark contrast with the across-the-board sequestration cuts we have been operating under for the last six months. Rather than slashing crucial investments in our infrastructure, our bill supports critical transportation projects across the country, and it fully funds the highway and transit grant programs that allow our states and local agencies to keep our transportation system working. Rather than leaving our cities and towns who have been hit hard by the recession to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, our bill strongly supports community development grants which offer the tools to strengthen small businesses and local economies. Instead of asking the most vulnerable to bear the burden of spending cuts, our bill funds a critical piece of the safety net, housing assistance, homeless shelters for millions of struggling families and seniors who are just one step away from the street. Mr. President, as any business owner will tell you, it makes no sense to slash the investments that allow you to compete and prosper in the long term just to make the numbers work in the short term. And the investments that are laid out in our bill are great examples. They make our country stronger by supporting job creation and economic growth and by keeping our commitment to help those most in need to get back on their feet. The need for these investments far exceeds the resources in our bill. But the bill that Senator Collins and I work, wrote keeps our commitment to our states and to our communities and makes sure the agencies in the bill can meet their statutory responsibilities. That will not be the case if sequestration continues for yet another year, which would make these in commitments impossible to keep. And it's important to note, Mr. President, that the Housing and Transportation Bill addresses challenges our country faces today. A full-year bill enables Congress to adjust funding levels to meet current needs and to implement new policies that address the problems that have come to light in recent years. This is something that does not happen when we opt for long-term continuing resolutions. For example, as a great example, we know that one in every four of our bridges is now considered deficient by the Federal Highway Administration. Our bill includes funding to repair or replace deficient bridges across the country in order to protect the safety and reliability of our transportation system. If we simply extend the funding letter, le uh, levels that we debated two years ago, then those investments and many others that create jobs and protect public safety and support the most vulnerable will be lost. And we'll also lose the improvements our bill makes to programs including reforms that address concerns members have raised the last time the transportation and housing bill came here to the Senate floor. Our bill, Mr. President, includes important Section 8 reforms that will reduce costs and create 
efficiencies. It contains reforms to improve the oversight of public housing agencies and boards and ensures accountability for property owners that don't maintain the quality of their HUD assisted housing and it increases accountability in the CDBG program. Mr. President, it's so important that we enact those reforms and do the important oversight of federal programs and agencies that the public expects us to do. So for all those reasons, Mr. President, we need to pass this continuing resolution so we keep the government running, and then we've got to move forward on a longer-term budget agreement that replaces sequestration with more responsible deficit reduction, a, a bill that puts our families and our economy first and allows us to enact real, thoughtful solutions to our country's challenges instead of these stopgap measures that do not move us forward. Investing in our families, in our communities, and long-term economic growth shouldn't be partisan. And I think that the bipartisan work that went into the Housing and Transportation Bill and the strong support that it received in committee proves they don't have to be. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.